there, Dr. Anna Maria Helt, herbalist and microbiologist with osada.com. Welcome to Mushrooms, Monday's Mushroom, episode 17. This week I'm going to talk about a mushroom called Sewillus kybibensis, uh, which I just happened to find in town. So mushroom foragers tend to be opportunists. We're not shy about harvesting mushrooms if we find them in the middle of the city. So here they are. Here is one that I haven't quite dissected yet. Uh, the cap is a tan to yellowish color. And then the pore surface here um, is a yellowish color. These are actually tubes. So if you look at the mushroom chopped, that yellowish surface there on the bottom of the cap, I don't know how well that's showing up. You might be able to see some striations there. They're actually tubes that produce the spores and then the spores will come out of the bottom. And that's one of the ways that the fungus reproduces. The stalk is, tends to be somewhat lighter in color than the top of the, the cap. So it'll be sort of whitish to yellowish with little speckles on it. Now, to be clear, uh, what I'm telling you here is not sufficient for making a positive ID of this mushroom when I'm showing you here. It is good to look at videos. It is good to look at pictures, but you should never harvest a mushroom for eating until you know that mushroom really well and you've spore printed it. Maybe you've gone on some forays with people that uh, are expert mushroom foragers before you ever stick anything in your mouth. Your life depends on it, quite frankly. Um, or in the least, maybe you get a really nasty case of the runs. Uh, so mushrooms in the Suillus genus, S-U-I-L-L-U-S, -L -L are uh, slimy on top uh, in general. So you can maybe see the shine on that cap. I just wiped a little bit of it off. Um, you can see the shine on this cap. And especially when it rains, they get really slimy on top. And in fact, with this mushroom cooking it, uh, you have to really dry saute it for a while if you want to get rid of that slimy texture. Uh, but I found it to be a really delicious mushroom. But like I said, you, you know, don't go out and pick something that you think looks like this and eat it. You could uh, run into some serious problems, learn how to properly identify. And so spore printing is one of the key things I do uh, on top of multiple other steps to make a posit positive mushroom ID. You can't see them right now, but under these two bowls, I have Suillus mushroom caps where I've detached them from the stipe, the stalk here, and I've put them sort of uh, tube side down or pore side down uh, onto some paper. And I'm using white paper here because this species has um, somewhat brownish spores, so they should show up really nicely on that paper, but it's just a way that I'm further confirming identification of this fungus. You know, I'm using what it looks like, I'm using the lack of staining that I'm seeing after having cut this mushroom up and let it sit out for a little while. I'm using the spore print, I'm using where it was growing, what trees it was growing by, in this case it's ponderosa pine, all of these various things to make an ID. I'm also going to be looking, here we go, uh, at the spores under a microscope slide. So if, and actually at the, the tubes as well, to look at microstructure. And I'll do that momentarily. And if I actually get a good picture, I will include it in the video. So Suillus kybabensis, it's named kybabensis because it was first identified in Kaiba National Forest. So near the north rim of the Grand Canyon. So what I'm doing here is simmering them down into a syrup. So I'm going to gently cook them down. I just reduce the heat on these chunks. And uh, this is an experiment with this particular mushroom. I know the idea is 100% beyond a doubt. I'm cooking it down. Um, once I'm done cooking it, I will strain it and collect the water, which will probably be pretty slimy from the mushroom polysaccharides. And then I'm going to use um, some honey Oh, actually quite a bit of honey to preserve it for a mushroom syrup that I'll mostly use for flavoring. I like to do all sorts of experimental recipes with edible mushrooms, wild mushrooms. But again, uh, not to be messed with if you're being lazy on identification in terms of hunting wild mushrooms. So just pay attention. Now, just looking back at the mushroom a little bit more, here's um, a stalk or a stipe that's been cut 
And as I said earlier, you don't see a staining reaction where it turns blue or brown or red or what have you. The flesh is white, um, pretty firm here. Uh, and then this is uh, the top of a cap after I've peeled the skin off. And so it's a little yellow right underneath the cap. But then the flesh itself, when you cut in more, is white. Um, again, here's another cap. Um, and when I'm talking about peeling, I'm just peeling that cap skin off here because it can get pretty slimy. So I do that with Sue Willis, uh, Slippery Jacks in general because of the slimy cap. The texture can be unappealing to people. Um, with bolites, uh, some people, like the Rocky Mountain Red Top Bolite, some people will peel the cap skin off on that one as well. Um, I often just kind of leave it there. Um, I will pull the tubes, these guys, this yellow spongy layer, off of larger fruiting bodies just because of the texture. But I've met some people that at least for uh, Rocky Mountain Red Top Bolites, um, they save the tube layer and powder them and use it as a nutritive powder. So I've never tried that before. Um, what I'm actually going to do is put these out by my pine tree out back, or the pine tree out back, it's not mine, um, and see if I can get a mycorrhizal association going with that tree. Unlikely, but this is a mycorrhizal fungus, which means it grows in association with plant roots, and in the case of Sulis carpivensis, it's often ponderosa pine. Uh, that is, you know, mycorrhizal mushrooms, that is a type of fungus that you can't just simply grow um, yourself. It's a complex interaction with its host tree. And so it's been very difficult for people to grow mycorrhizal mushrooms. There's been some tiny bit of success with chanterelles, but it would be so expensive to try to grow them that way because it's very inefficient. Um, and I'm not aware of anybody being able to grow things like boletes, for instance, other than culturing the mycelia, um, what we think of as the underground portion in a petri dish in the lab. So there you go, Suillus carbivensis. Uh, maybe I'll tune in on the next one, <laughs> or even later today, and tell you how the syrup turned out. So here's the finished mushroom syrup that I was talking about. Uh, I wound up using honey and also a little bit of cane alcohol for the final product. Uh, the, both the honey and the alcohol will have preservative properties, but I don't like to use so much honey that that's all you can really taste in the syrup and it overwhelms the mushroom, especially in this case where the mushroom flavor in the syrup is more subtle. Um, so because I use lower amounts of honey by itself, it's not sufficient to preserve. So I will add in some alcohol um, to a final concentration of just over 20%, which is what you need to preserve. So there's the syrup and a little squirt a dropper thing there. And then here's the spore print. They worked beautifully. So you can see when there are a whole bunch of spores piled up on each other in mass, you can see the color. And so this is the characteristic cinnamon brown color of kaibab slippery jack or suillus kaibabensis, a very important step in making proper mushroom identification. And if you want to be extra careful uh, and or if you're a geek, you can even look at the spores under a microscope. So these are some of the spores uh, magnified at a thousand uh, fold magnification where you can see their general shape and size and, and other details of the spores that are characteristic in helping somebody make a positive species identification. So that's it, uh, Kaibab Slippery Jack. Thanks for watching.